uh, before we jump into it, I want to go ahead and pray, and then we can begin. Is that all right? Is that all right? All right, let's go ahead and pray and go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for uh, this evening, God, and we thank you for uh, the precious, God, holy, written word of God. Uh, Father, it, it is indeed all of those things and so much more. Uh, God, it, it contains within it, Lord, the power to transform our lives and, to, and, and the ability to do in our lives, God, what no other power can do. So, God, open up our hearts uh, to receive, open up our eyes that we may see, Lord, our, our ears that we may hear your voice and receive. And God, we'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you accomplish in and through your word. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, uh, tonight I'm excited about what I want to share. Um, as I was going over this, I, I was telling my wife, I'm not sure if this is a preaching message or a teaching message, so uh, we'll, we'll see where, where God wants us to go. But um, if you're taking notes tonight, uh, the title of the message is this, Things to Do with Jesus. Things to Do with Jesus. And tonight we're going to be talking about uh, three specific things. And um, now I, I got to be clear about uh, about where we're going here because I, 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 these three things that we're going to talk about are, uh, you know, they're specific. They kind of they're kind of in a category. And then there's some other things that you can do with Jesus that are in a kind of in a different category that I that we don't want to talk about, or at least we want to make a distinction. Uh, so today we are not talking about doing things with Jesus. Today we are talking about doing things with Jesus. Is that helpful? <laughs> okay, okay, all right. I, I promise this is going to make sense. Okay, so, so let's do this. For everybody here today, under the sound of my voice, there is a gift and there is a call on your life. God has, has gifted you. God has called you. The Bible talks about there are gifts differing among us, and they're all for a purpose of building the kingdom of God. Aren't you thankful today that you have a purpose in your life, that God has called you, that God has gifted you, that God has commissioned you and I to go out and to build the kingdom of God, build one another and, 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 and evangelize the world. And all of us have gifts. All of us have callings. And your calling may be different from mine. Your gift may be different from the person sitting next to you, the person sitting behind you, the person sitting in front of you, but no matter what your influence is or what your gift is or what your calling or your purpose is, aren't you thankful tonight that you're going to get to do that alongside Jesus? You see, this is, this is God's work that he wants to accomplish on the earth. Jesus prayed, let your kingdom come, God, let your will be done. This is not about me and my gifting, you and your gifting, and just going out there and kind of figuring it out all on our own, what we're going to do, what we think is good, what we think is not good. This is all, the Bible says it this way, that we are co-laborers together with him building his kingdom. We pray here all the time in his field, building his kingdom. So as we operate in the gifts and the callings that God has for us, we are doing them in tandem with Jesus. We are doing them in conjunction with Jesus, in cooperation with him. And I'll tell you what, there's no better way than to exercise your gifts than to do it with Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, mo most of you here know that I sing, and, you know, I could go out there and I could sing all kinds of songs, but I'll tell you what, the best kind of singing is when you're singing to glorify Jesus Christ, and when you're moving with the Spirit, when you get up here and you see God do great and mighty things. That's what I'm talking about, okay? But we are not talking about doing those kinds of things with Jesus, the things that you do alongside of him. We are talking about what are you going to do with Jesus now that you have obtained him? Now that you have him, what are the next steps. See, it's, it's vitally important for you and I to understand that what we do with Jesus is important. What, what you do with Jesus is vitally important. We understand this from a, a salvation standpoint, right? Uh, the gospel message is, is preached, and people have a decision to make when, when the gospel message comes forth. Either they can uh, receive Jesus, what they're doing with Jesus is receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, or they can choose to reject the message, right? Uh, one, the person who receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior obtains salvation. The person who rejects the message remains lost in their sin. So we understand from a salvation standpoint that what we do with Jesus is vitally important. 
Okay, but then after you've attained, obtained Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, am I in a building tonight with a bunch of people who have given Jesus Christ all of their heart and all of their life and are thankful unto God for the work that he has done? Amen. And if you're not, that's all right. We'll take care of that in just a few moments. Okay, but for the vast majority of us in here, we've given Jesus Christ our heart and our life. We've obtained salvation. Okay, what do we do now? What is the, the next step? What are the next steps? And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Things to do with Jesus now that you have obtained him. All right? Brother Hagen used to make this statement. I like it so much. He used to say this. He said, he would say, don't stop at the cross. Go on to Pentecost. Kind of has a nice little rhyme to it, right? I, I, I really like that. Don't stop at the cross go on to Pentecost. What Brother, Brother Hagen was talking about is, hey, salvation is amazing, right? Uh, salvation is wonderful, and we'll be forever grateful. And by no means today are we minimizing or diminishing what God has done in our lives and, and saving us and pulling us out of hell. Come on, somebody, for forgiving us of our sins and getting us into the place where God would have us to be, headed for heaven, denying hell. Okay, but, but that's just the entry point. That's just the beginning of our relationship with God. And what Brother Hagen was trying to say is, hey, once you've gotten saved, hey, there's a subsequent ex experience. As wonderful as it was to get born again, hey, there's another experience that Jesus wants you to have. And that experience is to get filled with the Holy Ghost, to get empowered, to, inherit, you know, to get your prayer language, to begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, edify yourself. Come on, pray for things that you don't know how to pray for as you want because the Spirit inside you is making intercession. Come on, you guys know what I'm any radical, fanatical people in the house who are thankful to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so he was saying, don't stop at the cross. Go on to Pentecost. And I like that so much because I think it's very easy for us as believers, especially here in the United States of America, to get saved and be content with, hey, I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell when God has so much more. And then he wouldn't stop there. He would say, and don't stop at Pentecost. How many of you know something? Don't raise your hand. Don't look at the person next to you. How many of some people have stopped at Pentecost? Right? He would say, don't stop at Pentecost. Go ahead on now and be seated with Christ. And what he was talking about is realizing and exercising the authority that you have now that you're a believer. How many know the Bible talks about how Jesus, when he rose again, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality, power, and dominion, and over every name that is named. But it doesn't stop there. In Ephesians, it goes on, Ephesians chapter 2, and we have been seated together with him in heavenly places. Hey, what I'm trying to say to you today is you have a right and you have authority to kick the devil out of your life. Come on, somebody. To tell the devil enough is enough. You have to stop right where you're at, and in the name of Jesus, you have to turn right. You just do a 180 and you go back the other direction because we have authority now in Jesus Christ. What, what was Brother Hagin talking about? He was talking about the progression that you and I should have as believers. This Christian walk is a progressive one. We are moving from faith to faith. Come on, somebody. We are going from glory to glory. First Peter, I love First Peter. First Peter comes along and says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and, and on and on. Come on. Onward Christian soldier marching as to war. This, is, this Christian life is, a, is, is supposed to be a progressive one. I love so much. I know I'm quoting a lot of verses. I just can't get away from it. It's in me. And so I'm just trusting that God will minister to you through it. But uh, there in, in, um, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about how, man, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And I believe in going from glory to glory and from faith to faith. So, so things to do with Jesus. Now that we've obtained him, what do we do with him, all right? Number one, we need to learn of him. Now that you've obtained Jesus, now that he is your Lord and he is your Savior, it's time to begin to learn of him. If you brought your Bible, let's go to Matthew chapter 11, and let's begin reading with verse number 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. And these are some real uh, encouraging words from, from Jesus. Refreshing words uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ, but they contain within them some principles that I think are important for us to understand. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28 and 29. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Underline it. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I read that to you out of the New King James. I want to read to you from the Old King James. Actually, there's no such thing as the Old King James. King James. It's just the King James Version, all right? But this one says, take my yoke upon you, and he says, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Verse number 29, learn of me. First, first one, learn from me. Second one, learn of me. I just really like that, learn of me. It's just, it's just, so, it's just so much more personal. Actually, I see in kind of these two different translations that I can learn from Jesus in, in a couple different ways. Number one, I can learn from Jesus by the things that he says. How many of you know that Jesus taught in the word of God? Most of us understand that, hey, I need, to, I need to pay attention to the teachings of Jesus, and I need to learn about God and what he wants for me to do. But then here in the King James, it, it kind of has this learn of me. And I like that because it, it tells me that I can learn from the example that Jesus left. Not just from his teaching, but from his actions as well. Now, I, I know a lot of people who I, I've heard say, well, I ain't Jesus. That's why I have this attitude. That's why, I, that's why I act this way. That's why I do what I do. Because I ain't Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus, I'm, and I'm thankful that I'm forgiven. I'm thankful for his grace, but I ain't Jesus. But just because we're not Jesus doesn't mean that we're not supposed to strive to become more and more like him. Isn't that right? The Bible says that, that God's desire for us is that we'd be transformed into his image. And so we ought to be, Jesus says, hey, the works that I do, those who believe in me, they will do also and greater things. And there's a, that's a lot of pressure, y'all. Jesus is expecting us to learn not only from his teaching, but from, from his example. And so we need to begin to, uh, now that we have Jesus, we need to begin to learn of him. Now I want to make this point, and I think it's an important one, and that is this, that God has given you and I the responsibility to learn. You have a responsibility on your life to get educated. Come on, turn to your neighbor and look at them and say, uh, it's your responsibility to get educated. Educated, we're, talk we're, we're having fun, okay? Educated, all right? You've got to learn. I've got to learn. It is nobody else's responsibility. It is not your spouse's responsibility. It is not your boss's responsibility. It is not your neighbor's responsibility. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to learn of him. Jesus has given the invitation. Now it's time for you and I to take advantage of that invitation and to begin to ask God, teach me, show me, reveal to me. God, I want some revelation. I want some wisdom. I want some understanding when it comes to who you are and the principles of the kingdom. It's vitally important when it comes to our success as believers. Somebody once said, growing up is not inevitable. It's a choice. Growing up is not inevitable. It is a choice. In, order for, in other words, you, you can't learn of God, learn the things of the kingdom of God just sitting there doing nothing. There is no such thing as that matrix chair. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Matrix. There's this matrix chair. You sit down and they plug something in the back of your brain and just download all the information that you could ever want in a moment's time. It doesn't work that way. No such thing. Never going to happen. In fact, when you get to heaven, you're going to have to do things. The old, I believe you're going to have to do things the old-fashioned way. You're going to have to sit down and open up some books, and you're going to have to read from the Word of God, and you're going to have to learn. Might as well do it now. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll leave that one alone because you, you guys... But growing up is not inevitable, okay? It, it's a choice. That means it's going to take an effort on our part uh, to be diligent and, and, and put in the necessary investment uh, to learn. L look again with me at, at Matthew chapter 11, because I, I believe this be it starts to become even more, um, uh, holding even more weight as we really look at what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking to people here in Matthew chapter 11 who are laboring, who are heavy laden, people who have some soul exhaustion, people who, do, who are not experiencing the rest that God offers. Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever been in, in, a, in a position or in a season in life where your soul felt exhausted, it is exhausting. <laughs> it, is, it, it, it is rough. Uh, look, let me put it to you this way. You can be exhausted physically, 
But because of the inside, if you've got strength and if you've got the joy of the Lord, come on, if you have a word from God, if you've got some spiritual stuff on the inside, the inside will, will, will supersede the outside and you can go ahead and do what God's called you to do and arrive where God's called you to arrive. I, I love verses that talk about, you know, this outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day unto day by the Spirit of God. And so you can have outward exhaustion, but if you have inward strength, man, that inward strength will, will supersede that outward exhaustion. However, if things are flipped, I, actually, there's one other verse. Let me, let me say this. The Bible says in the Old Testament, the spirit of a man will sustain him in time of sickness. When the inside is strong, it can supersede the outside, okay? But when things are flipped, when you've got an outward energy, but you've got an inward uh, uh, void, you could have, that inward void will sap all the energy and all the strength that you have outwardly. To be inwardly exhausted, okay, and, and heavy laden and, and, and weary is a whole lot worse than being outwardly. And so Jesus is talking to some people who are in a pretty rough uh, a, a position in life. Notice what he prescribes, okay, as the, as the solution. One more time, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Okay, take my yoke upon you. It's kind of two pronged here. The first part is take my yoke upon you and just simply for tonight, do things my way. Give up your way and do them my way. Okay, and we'll leave that alone for another time. But the second part here is and learn from me. Could it be that the inward exhaustion and the difficult season that we are facing today, could it be that the prescription, the antidote, uh, for lack of a better term, to move us beyond this season uh, is to learn of Jesus Christ. Maybe the difficulty we're in, we're in because of a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding. It could be. It, it could very, how, how about this? Hosea chapter 4, verse number 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 13. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity. Because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Why? Because of a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding. Now, no, 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 listen, I, I don't want to paint the wrong picture here. I don't want anybody feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't know everything I'm supposed to know. I'm doomed. No, 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 no. God has given us the, the word of God. God has given us the spirit of truth. God is on our side. God is trying to speak to us. God is trying to move in our hearts and our lives. It just takes somebody to say, hey God, here I am. I want to learn. And to begin to pursue God. Okay, so, so, so uh, th this, is, this is not to say that you're without hope if you don't feel like you know everything you should. This is just to say, hey, you need to start learning if you're not, and if you're learning, don't stop. Yeah. Amen. Now, I want to show, show you this principle uh, in, in, a, in a little story here in Mark chapter 5. So if you brought your Bibles, go, let's go to Mark chapter 5, verse number 25, and we'll find this story of, of a woman with an issue of blood. And she has this, this uh, blood flow. Uh, it's been going on for 12 years. And uh, not only is this, you know, a, a horrendous situation, but the Bible goes further to, to tell us that uh, this woman has uh, been seeing all kinds of doctors. I don't know if you've been there, but it, it can get kind of frustrating when doctors don't have the answer. And you go to this specialist and to that, the, to that specialist and to uh, this hospital and, and, and that hospital. And it's like nobody has any answers. I, I, I don't know what's going on. And that's the situation she's in. In fact, the Bible goes further and says that she has spent everything she has and hasn't gotten any, any better but only grew worse. And so we pick up here. Of course, if you're familiar with the story, you know that uh, she meets up with Jesus, she touches his clothing, and she's made well. But there was a turning point for her, and I want to show it to you, okay? Mark chapter 5, verse number 25. It says, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many phys uh, physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, okay, but rather grew worse. Underline this next phrase, when she heard about Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. 
This is kind of how I see it going down. I, I, I see this woman, she comes over to a friend's house, and the friend's like, how you doing, girlfriend? You doing all right? Like, I know, I know things have been rough these last, these last 12 years, you know, are things getting any better? And, and that same old, you know, uh, shaking of the head and that downward look, and, she's, and, and, and her friend thinks to herself, I got to change the subject because this ain't going well. I'm not helping. I, you know what? Have you heard about all the commotion going on in the region? Really, what commotion? Yeah, apparently there's this guy, uh, his name is Jesus. He claims to be the Messiah. Oh, really? In- interesting. You no, know, you want to know what's interesting is uh, uh, there, are, there are other reports that um, not only does he claim to be the Messiah, but the blind, they get their sight. The deaf hear. Uh, the crippled walk. The, the leopard is cleansed. In fact, there's even been reports of the dead being raised. And all of a sudden, this woman begins to realize Jesus is my answer. Let me put it to you this way. This woman conquered her ignorance about Jesus. And when she did, that opened up the door for her to run to Jesus and find her healing. It says, when she heard of Jesus, then faith was born in her heart, and she said to herself, oh, if I could just touch this one's garment, I'm going to be healed. You see, the season that we're in, sometimes we're in it, and sometimes it can be prolonged because of a lack of knowledge. But all of a sudden, when we get the knowledge that, 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 you know, that God has for us, knowledge of who he is, knowledge of how the kingdom of God works, the principles of the kingdom, all of a sudden, it changes our approach. And all of a sudden, we begin to reap the blessings and, and the freedom and the things that God has for us. But it takes you and I coming to a place where we say, you know what, I'm not going to remain ignorant. I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to find out what I need to know. How do I do that? When's the last time you prayed and asked God for understanding? Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call out to me. Ask me. I love James. It says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. I love, I love Paul the apostle in Ephesians chapter 1. He, he prays for the, the, the church at Ephesus, and he says, Oh, Father of my Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give to them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know, that they would know. Half the battle is knowing. But as long as we remain ignorant, we will not experience victory. Ignorance and victory cannot go together. So cry out to God. Ask God. How about the Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15 in the Old King James? Study to show yourself approved to God. A, work, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We live in a generation that can't even bring their Bibles to church. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching real good. I love you. But I'm a pastor, and so I'm supposed to help you, right? I'm supposed to challenge you, right? Is this okay? Can I talk like this, Pastor Dan? Is this all right? We need to start bringing our Bibles to church. I mean, at least download the app. How hard can it be, people? And don't just download the app. Actually open it up. Put your phone on airplane mode. Stop the text messages and the games and start to pay attention. Like Lauren Hill said, if you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. Right? Study. Open up your Bible. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. All right? It doesn't matter where you're at today. If you just got saved last week, if you've been saved 50,000 years, all right? Start learning if you're not. And if you are, never stop. All right? Learn of him. Number two, walk in him. Walk in him. All right? So our first point is learn of him. Now you got to walk in him, all right? Simply put, all right, once you've learned, you've got to do something with that knowledge. Like I said just a few moments ago, learning is half the battle, okay? The other half of the battle is applying what you've learned. You and I can accumulate a whole lot of knowledge, a whole lot of information. We can get the Holy Ghost goosebumps. We can get inspired. We can get motivated. But until you put one foot in front of the other, come on, somebody, we're going to be, the Bible says that we, you know, we'll deceive ourselves, because we're hearers and not doers. Uh, so, uh, so look, now don't get me wrong. Knowing is a whole lot better than being ignorant. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But once you get the knowledge, now it's time to apply it. 
And I love this in Colossians chapter two. Let's go ahead and turn there. Colossians chapter two, verse number six. Man, I told myself to limit the amount of verses and I, apparently I've, I've blown it, so I'll have to work on that next time. Uh, Colossians chapter two, verse number six. Hey, this will help you. If, if I'm going too fast, just write down the reference and, lead it, and read it later. Right? Because we're taking notes, not, sh- not just to look like we're a spiritual person, but so we can actually read it later. Hey, Amen. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Come on, somebody. All right? Colossians, what I tell you? 2.6. Oh, see, look at you guys. You, so good. He says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. What you've learned of him, what you've known of him, what you've experienced from him, walk that out. As you have received him, so walk in him. What you've learned, put to practice. I, I, I love this because this, this is also, it, it tells me that, you know what, when it comes to walking, walking out what I've learned about God, what I know about God, hey, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to water it down. The same way that I've received, let me go ahead and live it out just like that. Don't want to water it down. Don't want to mix it up. Actually, these people in, in, in Colossae, they're, they're having some issues because they're mixing Christianity with, with Greek philosophy and all this, kind of, all this kind of crazy stuff. They're getting all mixed up. And Paul has to write and say, hey, listen, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. So as you have received him, walk in him. Okay? So when you apply what you've learned, that's living in Christ. The goal, or one of the goals of our lives as Christians is to live our lives out <clears throat> in Christ. That happens when we live out what we've learned, okay? The goal is to live our life in Christ. How many of you believe that now that you're born again, life should be different? Life should be different than the way that you used to live. It shouldn't continue the same from the time you were saved to the time you got born again. I didn't, I didn't say you're not, you're not, I didn't say you're going to be perfect. You're not going to make mistakes. Uh, uh, Thank God for his grace and his mercy because if without his, the Bible says if God's counted sins, who could stand? I couldn't stand, you couldn't stand, and especially Pastor Jim, he really couldn't stand. I'm kidding, Pastor Jim, I love you. Oh man, I'm going to get myself in trouble. (laughs) He's watching me, he's watching me. He told me that he, before service, I was like, ah! Okay. So thank God for his grace and his mercy, but life ought to be different. Life ought to be different. You know, you you came out of the kingdom of darkness. You came out of uh, the family of the devil. Did you know that before you got saved, you were a child of the devil? That's what Jesus said, right? All of us. And, And the Bible says we've come out of that. We've come into the kingdom of the son of his love. We are now children of God. We are now walking in the light. We're not walking in the darkness anymore. Oh, 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 when I walk into my garage, I stub my toe every once in a while. Okay? But when it's dark, I I trip, I fall, right? When the light comes on, I might stub my toe every once in a while, but I, I can see where I'm going, and I'm making good decisions, and I'm steering clear of the pitfalls of life. You you follow me? Okay? Life ought to be different. Now, let me say this. Life... As a, as a believer, life in Christ is more than just, you know, making sure we don't sin. I think some Christians walk around thinking, okay, I got to stay away from that, and I got to stay away from that, and I got to stay from, uh, yeah, okay, we got to stay away from some things. But the Christian life is more than just making sure I don't do the big sins. The Christian life is a life in Christ. What does that look like? It looks like a life of the Spirit. Life in the spirit. The Bible says that God has given us, uh, given us his spirit, and now we cry out, Abba, Father. Now we have been set free from the bondage of sin. Now the spirit, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. We, the, a life in Christ looks like a life in the spirit. A, a, a life in Christ looks like a life of grace. I, I, I love second, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse number 17. I know this is a lot of verses, but that's all right. It, it's, it's one of my favorite. It, it says this. It says that all who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. A life of grace, 
a life of righteousness, a life of peace, a life of joy, a life of truth. Come on, somebody. Time would fail us to talk about all the benefits that come from living out our life in Christ. Indeed, he is the Christ of unsearchable riches. And so we need to begin to live our lives out in Christ. And man, what a, what a wonderful blessing it will be when we learn and then when we put to practice what we've learned. Last point for today, what do we do with, what do we do with Jesus? Things to do with Jesus. Number three, well, let me say this. Number one, learn of him. Number two, walk in him. And number three, I like this one. This is probably one of my favorites. Walk with him. 1 Corinthians 1.9. Let's go ahead and turn there. 1 Corinthians 1 9. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called, and here's the phrase, here's the catchphrase, into the fellowship of his son. Walk with him. If you go all the way back to the beginning, you'll find the real reason we were created. We weren't created to build skyscrapers. We weren't created to be on platforms and pedestals, receive awards. We weren't, number one purpose was to walk with God. And you can see man and woman walking with God in the cool of the garden. How cool was that? Walking with God. Talking with God. Seeing one another face to face. You know, the Bible says one day we'll get to do that. We'll get to see our Savior face to face. Let me say this, because I was thinking about this earlier. Now, for some of you, that doesn't sound very exciting. Like, oh, great, I get to go on a walk with Jesus. So fun. You know, I think of walking my dog. My dog, he, he's so undisciplined. He yanks and pulls the entire way, and I'm doing this number, you know. The last thing I want to do is go on a walk, right? But when we're talking about walking with God, we're not just talking about walking around the garden and saying, all right, thanks, Jesus. It was, great. It was a great hour. Talk to you later. The, the, we're talking about an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and by the way, there was a whole lot of activities that they shared in the garden, I was thinking to myself earlier, you know, had we not messed up, we probably would have invented things like, can you, could, could you imagine a time of a creativity? We probably would have invented cars like 4,000 years prior, 4,000 years early. And they would have been environmentally friendly. And I'm not trying to get political. <laughs> I promise. Okay? But, but that was our, that, that's the reason why we were created, to walk with God. You know the story, humanity lost fellowship with God. And ever since then, God has desired to restore fellowship with people. Ever since then. And he has through Jesus Christ, thank God. It's interesting because from Adam and Eve, after they fell, we get these glimpses of these people who actually walk with God after the fall. Okay, wasn't anything, uh, you know, really compared to what Adam and Eve got to experience before they fell. But we get this gl- these glimpses. The Bible tells us that Noah walked with God. The Bible tells us that Abraham was called the friend of God. We, we see, if, just forget about King David's stories. Just look at his writings. He wrote prolifically about his relationship with God. How about Paul the Apostle? I love it. In Philippians chapter 3 in the Amplified Version, it says that, he says, my determined purpose is to know him and to become more deeply and intimately acquainted with the wonders of his person. Oh, I, I, I love that. One writer says that none compare to the 40 days Moses had alone with God on the mountain. Wow. Actually, both Moses and Abraham changed God's mind on an issue. Imagine that. I just want to make two points and we'll close. Actually, one point, I'll read you something. Seems to me that those who were most successful and accomplished the the most had this one thing in common. They habitually walked with God. Think of the people that we just named, Noah, 
Abraham, David, Moses, Paul. Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible says this, as a result of Christ's finished work on the cross, God now makes his permanent abode in the believer's heart. Hence, the fellowship which now prevails under the new covenant is nothing less than the vital spiritual union of the believer with Christ. Fellowship with God is the goal of the Christian life, and this relationship will be perfected forever when we see our Savior face to face, when God dwells with his people in the heavenly kingdom. Amen. What do we learn today? What to do with Jesus now that we've obtained him? I need to learn of him. I need to walk in him, live out what I've walked, and I need to walk with him. Come on, if you got something good from God's word, go ahead and give him a great big praise. Thank <clears throat> you.